in lecture four, I'm going to look at three words ending in ology, uh, epistemology, ontology, and methodology. And if I can say in just a couple of words what each of those mean, epistemology is the study of uh, practical instances. So we come to understand the nature of the world from how it is and how it presents itself to us. This is different, this is a more practical version of ontology. Now, ontology, we come to understand how the world is, not by looking at actual examples, but by reasoning, as it were, from first principles, using logic, and finding out not how the world is, but how the world must be. So ontology is a framework of how things have to be. Epistemology is a framework of how we find things to be, or how we infer from practical instances. A methodology is the study of method. So methodology uh, accounts for how it is that certain methods can link questions and answers, how certain methods can produce um, uh, anticipated results, and what the limits to that would be. So it's a, uh, there is a critique going on in methodology about the extent to which methods do or do not reveal information. So going back to our familiar slide here, we've already looked at um, an ontology of research, that research has to do so on. The word has to, must, these are indicators of an ontology. So in the beginning we were talking about these uh, requirements, these conditions, um, in terms of uh, a core uh, that research must have in order to be research. We cannot imagine research that doesn't conform to these conditions. Then we looked at it a bit more um, epistemologically. Uh, so there we were concerned a bit more with, well, what are the practical conditions in which we find these things? Let's talk about this in terms of question, answer, audience, and method, as it turns out, um, which are manifestations of uh, what previously we had talked about just ontologically. So at this level, in Lecture 2, we were speaking about research from more of an epistemological standpoint. Then, in Lecture 3, we were looking more in terms of methodology. So, uh, is, it, is it necessary? What are, what are the uh, operating conditions, um, the, the, uh, the practical conditions, in which this is going to happen, and in which we can see that we are going to get um, results that are relevant to us? And now, to some extent, bringing all of that together, uh, I want to use some um, a table that's very useful from writers who I admire, uh, Gubber and Lincoln, who have been on the reading list already. Uh, I want to use their table to talk about um, worldviews and paradigms that we that were introduced last time in the last lecture and to try and unpack that in a way that will lead us towards a, a research structure for uh, creative, creative arts, for art, design, architecture, music, research in these creative areas. So all the time uh, trying to move away from the dominant scientific paradigm in order to reformulate a concept of research that is more useful in these creative areas and in these professionally oriented areas. So the, the objective of the Research into Practice group is not to squeeze uh, the creative arts into the scientific mold or to try to design some kind of 
hybrid compromise, but to study existing forms of research in order to understand how do they operate, what are the operating conditions that make research successful in other areas so that we can understand and go back to first principles in order to derive a series of actions and attitudes that would be productive and meaningful in the creative arts. So building it from the bottom up, from a, a meta-level understanding of how research operates in other areas in the academy. So this is the, um, the beginning of the table. I'm going to unpack this a bit at a time from Gubber and Lincoln. The reference will be at, full reference will be at the end of the lecture. So they break down each um, research paradigm into an ontology, an epistemology, and a methodology. Let's see how that works. They start on one side of their table with positivism. Positivism is, well, was a scientific um, approach and an approach in, in philosophy and philosophy of science that was relatively short-lived, had its peak at the beginning of the 20th century, um, but is, if you like, the, the distillation of the scientific ideal. I think particularly it represents what people outside of science think scientists do and what is a scientific attitude. The extent to which actual scientists, especially these days, are positivists, I think they're, they're very rarely positivists. And in truth, in the history of science, there have been very few of them. But positivism is the view where there is an external world, so something that we could try and find out about. It's objective, it, it's really there. If only we have the right methods, we can find out about it. So we are going to find, if we, if we have a, an appropriate method, we are going to find true uh, truths about the world. It uses an experimental uh, methodology that involves uh, the traditional scientific experiment, which, when chosen appropriately, will verify our hypotheses, and we will then turn those hypotheses into truths, laws of nature, and so on. Now, as I said, this was... Um, a movement, when it was actually a movement at the beginning of the 20th century, for a relatively short period, I mean, you might think it peaked around the 1920s, um, and since then, the naivety of the realism that's involved at an ontological level, so in, in philosophy, where ontology is uh, often discussed, the naive realism of positivism it was unacceptably naive, and these days you, I think, would not find any philosophers wishing to claim that there is a real objective world that is simply hidden from our view, and it's the process of science to unpack that reality. Of course, the scientists in the white coats in the movies, they all say that kind of thing, which is why I said that I think this is often a view of what scientists do that's held by people who are not themselves scientists. So it's the movie version. And this has been replaced in the post-positivist period, which is really from the sort of 30s onwards, when we started to be uh, perhaps a bit more um, sceptical about the possible benefits of science especially post-Second World War, both socially, in terms of the, the uh, scientific socialism of Nazism, uh, and the benefits of atomic power, as evidenced by uh, nuclear missiles, uh, our enthusiasm for this kind of um, uh, unmediated realism, that, that there are simply facts out there rather than opinions and, and information to be um, uh, interpreted. This, this has uh, 
lost favour in in favour of even in science a a slightly more cautious approach. I suppose the um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle is is a good example, where what we can know about reality or the extent to which we can really posit that there is a reality that we're trying to find out about is is limited. All we can say is we have a high probability of, of understanding something is very likely to be the case. But most scientists don't speak in terms of um, absolute outcomes as opposed to relative outcomes. As a result, the, the epistemological views about how things are and how they're manifested um, relate more to the uh, include concepts of community, of a body of scientists from a, a particular point of view, uh, so something seems to be uh, true. And it's symptomatic of this post-positivist era that in science you have things like um, wave theory and particle theory, which are incompatible, uh, string theory, and other kinds of explanatory frameworks simultaneously uh, believed and, and uh, worked upon by different groups of scientists without apparently a, a technique or even a desire for one to overthrow the other in the traditional conjecture and refutation model. Methodologically, we see uh, that there are, there's more plurality involved in how one would go about experimentation, that one is more concerned with falsification than verification of hypotheses, and an admission of qualitative methods, um, not just quantitative methods, if we're contrasting post-positivism with positivism. Now, okay, I've been talking about sciences here, but as, as we move to the right of the diagram, you will see that the explanatory frameworks become more um, admitting of humanities and arts disciplines. It's hard to see how uh, anything that is done in the creative arts could be described as research or no knowledge building under the paradigm of positivism. So moving along, we uh, get what Gubber and Lincoln call um, critical theory as a paradigm. And here we have reality really created by the uh, social, political, and cultural groups who are describing it. So reality is a projection. We make the world in which we live uh, intellectually, the world of thought, the world of understanding, of how we interpret um, economic forces, uh, social interactions, and so on. And science isn't something outside of that. It's part of a larger social and cultural system that is not neutral. Uh, it unavoidably contains a human perspective, a gendered perspective, and so on. Although some of these may have been um, so uh, crystallized over time, as they say, um, that we fail to see the extent to which they are discretionary, that they could have been otherwise, had the, a different gender, a different race been in charge. Uh, it's a manifestation of the expression, uh, history is written by the victors. E epistemologically, we have a recognition that all of our experimental and experiential findings are going to be mediated by our understanding of them and the people who we are, the gender who we are, and so on. And methodologically, uh, we are going to be involved much more in comparative kinds of studies in which we evolve our understanding in reference to alternative frameworks, alternative understandings. We've lost a sense uh, methodologically under critical theory that we're striving after a truth. We're dealing relatively 
with things that we can know, with methods that we have to hand, and and uh, pragmatics of uh, un uh, understanding uh, and recognizing that humans have got uh, flawed or partial understandings of everything. And this then goes to the most extreme version, which, which again, perhaps like positivism, is not held by very many, but we need to understand the position in order to see the, the, uh, where it could go, where it could lead. And ontologically, constructivism is characterized by extreme relativism. So the constructivist would claim there really there is no external reality. There is only the projection that we make. So none of this information is truly coming from outside. Uh, for objectively, it is all a, a kind of projection of our own minds, our own understanding, our own point of view. But all of it really could be very different if we were able to occupy different uh, intellectual positions or perhaps step outside of the limitations of being human, something like that. Uh, likewise, epistemologically, um, it, it, the interaction between ourselves and the thing that we are investigating is, is unavoidable and is how we, we create meaning. The scientific ideal, of epistemological ideal, is that in the process of experimentation, we would minimize the effect of the researcher themselves. Researcher bias, it's called, in some areas. So the purpose of a, a, an experiment, a scientific experiment, under the model of positivism, would be to try to control out all of the individual variables, all of the personal aspects, um, uh, in order to reveal what is objectively true. The constructivist is in exactly the opposite position. The constructivist is recognized the inevitability of the, the interaction of researcher and the so-called external world. And this leads to interpretative methodologies such as hermeneutics, in, in which we try to we focus our attention not so much on the relationship with the external world, but in uh, understanding and developing a critical framework in which to evaluate uh, what it is we say and what it is we do. Uh, so much more focused on the, the human actor. Now, um, after Gabor and Lincoln created this table, <coughs> uh, Heron and Reason undertook a, a critique of it, and uh, they added an additional column in which they introduced participatory research and participatory inquiry as a, a slight modification of the, the four principal positions previously identified. So this is something recognizable particularly in uh, human sciences, <clears throat> in psychology, uh, in which we engage very much with uh, the other. Uh, and so uh, participative reality is co-created. It's something we do as a community, not so much as an individual. The constructivist critique is an individual one. In the participatory critique, we recognize that the reality that we cr create for ourselves is not created solely according to our own dreams and delusions, but is something socially uh, constrained. And so we tend to live in communities in which we develop similar beliefs, religious beliefs, political beliefs, and so on. But this uh, it develops all the time in transaction with, with others. Uh, it is a practical form of knowing in which we learn about the world through doing, and that informs our understanding of what the world is like. Uh, so it's uh, the knowledge that we really have of the world is uh, created through, through making. Now, here I think we start to recognize something very interesting for design and for fine art. Uh, 
And methodologically, um, the, the practical praxis, as it, it's sometimes critiqued these days in practice-based research, praxis is something that mediates our use or misuse of language. So um, Wittgenstein, for example, was uh, cautious that language had the power to lead us into uh, very false understandings or relationships with the external world. And praxis and the kind of practice-based understanding that comes through professional work and through creative work uh, is something is, is a, a methodology recognized in the participatory paradigm and is something very familiar, I think, in the, in, to us in the creative field. So this participatory paradigm and those working in it is very recognizable, I think, for, for us, a good place to go for uh, uh, research readings and writers who are adopting particularly a positivist approach, uh, so for example Popper, who's a famous uh, positivist scientist and philosopher of science, is unlikely to say something that's going to really cross over. Uh, interestingly, I think uh, Gibson, who is so often cited by designers, uh, and, and I think represents uh, probably an early post-positivist position, isn't not so useful, I think, um, as a, a thinker about how research could be in the creative areas. So these are for you to find out. Here you have a, a map that you can um, project onto the writers and the texts that you are reading and ask yourself, well, what is the underlying position here? What does this author, what's their relationship towards a research and how it relates to reality or the individual who is undertaking it. As usual, these are the, the readings. So the first one contains the, uh, the first four columns of the table and Heron and Reason were responsible for adding the participatory inquiry paradigm.